Welcome to a very special uh, Marvel movie talk. Uh, I am uh, once again <laughs> fortunate enough to be talking to the great Chris Claremont, uh, who I love talking about the old stuff. And we are going to talk about the old stuff, but it's always exciting when we also have some new stuff, which right now, as it disappears on the camera, uh, Madripoor Nights, which is uh, just started. And uh, we'll talk about that, some other stuff going on. And uh, I always, uh, when we have you on, Chris, I always recommend that people follow you on Instagram because uh, your adventures are uh, always uh, worth keeping an eye on, whether they're comic book related or not. You took a great trip to Hawaii recently, but specifically, I was noticing, I think this was at the end of last year, you went to Milan and Venice, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I have uh, been to both of those cities, uh, but never for a con. But I, what I love is when you post pictures like the ones I'm showing for a visual audience, uh, you know, that sort of like these characters are very clearly just universal. You know, everybody, you know, there's a, <laughs> a very affectionate Deadpool that jumped up on you. I but, uh, have I love, no I love idea. Stuff like, I... It's like recreating, uh, you know. Logan and, and Raven and you're caught in the middle, you know? Uh, so talk a little bit about sort of the appeal. I mean, as it appears that the appeal to these characters really is, it doesn't matter where you are, what language people see them in. It, it seems like obviously the favorites are still the favorites. It's, it's, you know, you're always going to have like a, a Wolverine in line waiting to take a picture with you. Well, actually one of the more interesting and unexpected places I found myself in back in 19 was Moscow. Oh. Yeah. I mean, this is before the world apparently went to, well, well got out of it, hand. In yes. The, 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 the world has gotten out of hands in, in many different directions uh, yeah. since 2019. But, um, no, it was great. We were there for about a week. Um, it met a lot of wonderful people, uh, did a signing that was only supposed to last an hour, and they finally threw us out of the building after three and a half hours, and there <laughs> were still people left. Um, Wolverine is surprisingly popular there, too. But yeah. to just have an experience talking to people, meeting fans, viewing a city that, quite frankly, I never expected to go to, um, was extraordinary and um again not realizing how utterly codswobble the world would become well it was pretty good at the time considering the administration but um who do the who'd have thought uh yeah i mean i, I figure the world just pfft, yeah, I figure whatever's going on, you know, in the world politically, pandemic wise, any of that, the people all still kind of probably seem about the same. They're all excited uh, about the same things. And, uh, you know, I did notice on your Instagram that uh, just a couple weeks, uh, you'll be at Planet Con in mm -hmm. uh, um, Kansas City, you know, uh, fresh off the heels of yet another Super Bowl victory. But uh, they'll they'll take a break from their celebrating to, you know, dress up like Dark Phoenix or Jubilee or what have you. Well, and, cool. Yeah. And what I want to tell people is having waited in the line for uh, for Chris to do a signing, it's always worth kind of being towards the front of the line because uh, you're very generous with your time. When people want to tell you about things, uh, you tell <laughs> stories. And so I think that uh, sometimes if you're if you get in the line late, you might end up like those people in Russia who got kicked out of the building. You know? Well, no, I, uh, I like to, I will, I will stay till everyone gets, gets signed. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, that's the bond. Uh, the interesting thing is thinking of Super Bowl victories that just uh, on the Brian Lehrer show here in New York, he just did a, a very nice conversation with Bill Bradley of, of the, who, of the New York Knicks and former Senator. And they were talking and Bill, well, Bill Bradley was saying, yes, it was fun being a Senator and I got an important bill passed. And the reality is wait two years and someone will come along and try to erase it or at least quote unquote modify it. But when you win a world championship, 
you've won the world championship. <laughs> and he says, it lasts for about, you know, half hour, 45 minutes. You're sitting there going, we are the champions. We <laughs> are the champions. Woo -hoo! And then, of course, you have to start getting in shape for next season because, yeah. yes, you were the world champions. You are the world champions. And now you're the world champions with a big target on, uh, you know, not target, but a target. <laughs> And it's it's remarkable. You now have to get back into the game. The extraordinary thing about St. Louis is now they're they've got to get back in the game. They've won three. Bravo. That only leaves them what seven more to catch up with um with the Patriots. Yeah, Boston? and it's it's the other corner of uh, Missouri. It's Kansas City. Sorry, my bad. Yeah. No, that's all right. I, all these I, I, I don't. I don't want. I don't want to get criticisms in the chat. So uh, just no, all, it's like all these town cities on flanking the Mississippi as it goes up and down. It gets very confusing, you know. Yeah. But I mean, we have rivers too. But fortunately, we. I live in a city that straddles all all of them. Yeah. Uh, but it's. One is really great, but now you have to go back next year and do it again. And it's, you know, and to do three in five years is ex extraordinary. Um, but that doesn't diminish the challenge of next year. And the brutal reality in New York is, much as I love the Mets, so, There's here. that other team that seems <laughs> yeah. to keep winning more often than yeah. not. Well, for the last yeah. fifty or sixty thousand years, they, they they only have the one this century, the one in two thousand nine. So you know the, 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 the but you know the Mets yeah, still the have the, or the Yankees. I, Yankees have the one in two thousand nine, the one championship. But yeah, yes, no, we're talking about the the late nineties that uh, that stretch. Uh, I still lived in New York at the time. So yes, as a Mets fan. And the last thing I think any of us wanted was a uh, subway series. It was like, I would have loved to have played the Seattle Mariners. That would have been a wonderful world series for me to enjoy. <laughs> Losing well, to the Yankees was just like, oh yeah, more of the same. Well, and then for those of us who go back to the era when there were four teams. Oh, sure. In the city. And I mean, the, the for me, the, Aside from the codswallop of roads going the going underneath Brooklyn Heights, the most unforgivable thing Robert Moses ever did was not find a way to keep the Dodgers in New York yeah. in Brooklyn, rather. I mean, you know, LA can have its own team. They should have its own team with its own name. That should have been a West Coast team not the Dodgers. The Dodgers are Brooklyn. And yes, that's an ancient now wish fulfillment, but there you go. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, I think that there were, there were uh, facets of uh, my family talking like my grandparents' generation who had been Brooklyn Dodgers fans. And then when they left, it was like, well, I'm just not going to watch baseball because God forbid I should watch the Yankees. So yeah. it sort of falls on you then to, <laughs> to uh, keep I mean, up with the mantle. Yeah. I like the Mets. Yeah. But the Dodgers would have been far more cool. See the Los Angeles Mets. <laughs> there you go. See, that's a, that's the, one of those uh, uh, team trades to be named later that they uh, could have done yeah. back then. Yeah, or the, the LA Quakes. Well, you know, there is Jake actually there is a, a there's a minor league team called in Rancho Cucamonga. Uh, as as I've lived in LA for 20 years, I know this. It's the uh, Rancho Cucamonga Quakes, and the venue they play in is called the Epicenter. Uh, oh, sort sense. of like asking for trouble, <laughs> you know. <laughs> See, there's there's a concept of a super of a of a TV series. A big hole opens in the center of LA, and you fall down and you find yourself in a world where it's nothing but baseball, dude. <laughs> no dinosaurs, baseball. <sighs> oh. It's always fun watching TV series and thinking, you know, Stan would have just laughed that out the door. <laughs> you know, give me a break, dudes. Yeah. We write stories, not... Yeah. Well, 
Speaking of uh, writing stories, it's a good transition to uh, talk about uh, Madripoor Nights number one, which uh, I'm, I'm holding and trying to make sure it doesn't disappear on camera. Uh, and now, number two should be out in a fortnight. Yes. Yeah, it'll be out in the uh, in the middle of March, from what I'm told. Middle and of March? I, I, <sighs> that's that's so what marvel.com says yeah so well, the first one came march. out february 7th and for some reason this one doesn't come out march 7th it comes out like the week after that so well I, which i think is after i'm in st louis so you know right. brilliant um well i want to just uh the starting point for this uh story of course is uh, an image that i think a lot of people will recognize to see which is this uh, great story from uh, Uncanny X-Men 268, which uh, is that uh, cover we've seen many times with uh, Logan, Natasha Romanoff, and of course, uh, Steve Rogers, uh, you know, a story that's set in the then present continuity, but also back in 1941. And, uh, I, you know, that the way that that story ends, because I, I reread it before reading the new book, and I'm like, oh, yeah, there really was kind of like, it's not like it ended ended. It was just sort of like, oh, I guess they got away. All right, next issue, uh, back to Rogue, you know, so. Uh, but in the uh, meantime, we'll go out to dinner. <laughs> right, right. Well, of course, they have to go out to dinner, you know. <laughs> you think I don't keep, pay attention to this stuff? No, I, I think I, I think you need to because uh, there, there's probably enough people who don't pay attention that uh, that's why you need to pay attention to it. Um, so talk a little bit about the idea of, you know, the, I guess this is the 50th year of Wolverine after his first appearance of uh, in what is it? Uh, Incredible Hulk 181, I believe. A, uh, a, a, yep. a book I've seen in the wild once or twice, but uh, never laid my hands on. You know, it's uh, it's 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 out of my tax bracket, Chris. I think you can understand <laughs> that. So, <laughs> but well, see, you ha it's out of your tax bracket. I've apparently lost all of my copies of X-Men 94. So, oh. Um, <laughs> People plan, God laughs. Yeah. <laughs> See, my theory is this, as I've said many times, the seventh day had nothing to do with resting. God was laughing too hard. <laughs> you know, it's like because when higher authority creates everything, there has to be somewhere to take the edge off, and we're it. Yeah. <laughs> Can you be amazed at the number of like, huh? <laughs> expressions i get when i tell that story almost as many as i get when you know it's like higher authority creates man uh, no, i can do better <laughs> yeah <laughs> and uh, you know considering who goes out to get to, to find the food and gets stepped on by mastodons versus who stays behind to cook the food clean the house take care of the kids knit the clothes, et cetera, you know, it, it, and when I tell that story, it's really cool to see who smiles and who is like, mm, what? Yeah. It's I'm very, sure. how shall I say gender <laughs> specific, but that's another story for another day. Well, that uh, image of uh, Uncanny 268, uh, you can go around on the internet and Wait, you'll what? see a lot of recreations. Uh, these are huh? just action figures, but you'll see, yeah, I'll leave it up there for you. you these are just action figures recreating it, Not but bad. you'll see uh, a lot of cosplay, which, you know, it's it's very tough. Uh, I would never, even as a younger man, have imagined trying to do a Captain America cosplay because, you know, I'm just not built that way, I guess. I wouldn't do a cosplay. I'd do a movie. Well, there you go. I, yeah, mean, I mean, you know, I mean, you think you've got Chris Evans, you've got Hugh Jackman, you've got um, Scarlett Johansson. Scarlett Johansson. Yeah. Plus, someone to be cast as as uh, Jubilee. Yeah, yeah. She, you know, in the the Fox X Men movies, she had like you know basically glorified cameos. They never really did much with Jubilee. Well, you know, Fox has no, I mean, there, Fox had enough trouble dealing with the X-Men as a concept because, you know, when you think it's just superheroes and it suddenly comes in at a hundred million opening weekend, then this is back in 2000, well, yeah. 2001, um, and they had no idea how to cope with success. 
the it, superheroes embarrass them. It's yeah. like, you know, on the other hand, there was an audience and why walk away from an audience when you've got something that appeals to them and if they just done it properly they i mean actually the fact that they did it properly and the next the next film on the block was spider-man from sony but the next film on the block was captain america was sorry iron man right and you know, aside from the fact that Robert Downey Jr. had a great time over the next dozen films, uh, Marvel Studios had a great time asserting itself as a mega studio. And, um, you know, that could have been Fox. But they just had no sense of what to do and how to do it well, other than the fact that, that they had a brilliant uh, producer in Lauren Schuler Donner. But again, they had, they had no idea how to, I mean, she, her sense of casting was brilliant. Yeah. But the movies that ended up getting made, not so much. Yeah. I, I, I still have uh, very warm feelings about the first two. And then it's a little bit of diminishing returns after that, where it's like, Oh, this character looked cool. This scene was good. Uh, you know? Uh, but yeah, I think that uh, after that, all of a sudden, just uh, too many things, you know, uh, I don't know what they were trying to do, it, but in terms of Sony, you know, when they were doing the, the Andrew Garfield Spider-Man, so their second iteration, that second movie is half of it is like set up for other characters for like a Sinister Six movie uh, for like how oh, no, they, they were going to bring yeah. in the whole panoply yeah. of the Spider-Man villains. I mean, uh, I can never think of name, but the star, the guy, there was an actor who was cast as the villain who looks like no, never mind. I hate. Well, it. the main I, the, the main it. villain in that one is is of course uh, is, is Jamie Jamie Fox playing Electro, but uh, the the actor. No, these are, these are all background vi yeah, villains yeah. that were setting up yeah. for a panel play of them. Right. But the 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 problem. I mean, they had a brilliant. The first three were brilliant in that you had a superb director in in terms of um, Sam Raimi who is about as good as it gets yeah and over a multitude of genres and apparently he was willing to come back for a fourth one except he only wanted one villain it, you know spider-man fighting five different villains i mean you've only got two hours two and a half hours or unless you're doing dune or a current superhero movie seven and a half hours yeah. uh but Audiences, you know, back in the dawn of time, we used to have intermissions if you had a seven-hour movie or a five-hour movie. So you could actually go out and and buy more popcorn without missing anything. Now you have to find the dull moment of the movie and run like hell. Um yeah, but I mean, I always, I always have to go in shifts with my wife. I'm like, I'm going to go, you tell me what happened, and then you go, and I'll tell you what happened, and uh, hopefully we don't miss anything, uh, you know. <laughs> I think that that was what I th realized watching um, the last movie, uh, the last Avengers, well, Marvel Studios movie, which was Thanos going up against everybody and everybody going up against Thanos. Sure. There were, you know, for me, the most telling exchange in the movie is like lord fano i want you to find the you know the the uh the, the five the infinity gem, stones gemstones what will you do i will sit here and wait <laughs> oh okay you're bored yeah you know so what are we supposed to do we're bored too you know it's just like really come on it a film like that should pretty much keep you on the edge of your seat for the two and a half hours. 
so yeah. that when you finally get to the moment where Doctor Strange looks at Tony Stark and and this is the one out of 11 million alternate right. possible realities, the only one that has a chance of working. But what's the but? Well, you may not. The chances are you won't be here for the end. Um, but that's, you know, that it's not my billion dollars that that are paying for it. So, you know, I mean, just the concept that two films will cost a billion dollars right off the top is just, you know. Well, and, come on, and guys, you, know, you are aware that 2001 only cost maybe 11 million? Yeah. <laughs> I won't even cover Scarlet. You know, oh, hey, I mean, the 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 lunch budget is more than eleven. I'm not talking about dinner as well. Just lunch is eleven oh, yeah. million now. No, no. So. I, but the thing, the, the the extraordinary thing about the films is, and the, the extraordinary challenge when you're dealing with X film, X Men films, X Canon films, is there. It's a team. And the minute you get a team in there, it things get really, really complicated. I mean, with the Marvel Studios, well, we established Iron Man, really cool movie. We established Captain America. Oh my God, this is really good. Who'd have thought? Then we established Thor, great character, first movie. Yeah, needs a little work. And you move on from there and you you know, um here's here's Pietro and Wanda. Leaving aside the moment that the reality that Pietro and Wanda are also in the X canon gets very complicated. But find a way to make them work. And, but then in the second Avengers uh Pietro gets you know, bye bye. Yeah, he did. He doesn't. He doesn't get out of the movie the the first time he appears. And yeah, and Quicksilver is of course one. No, of he gets characters. out of the movie the first time. He and Wanda right. work really well in the first movie that because they get captured and right. and change size. But then, in this the end of the second one, you know, he oops. Well, and a bit of, bit of the disadvantage was that, you know, the the Quicksilver they had in sort of the the first class era of X-Men movies, uh, Evan Peters, you know, had that sequence where they slow everything down, which, you know, was largely uh, tried to be recreated in the recent Flash movie. And it was like everybody loved that scene so much. So then this other character comes in and you're like, I'm Quicksilver. And you're like, yeah, I like the other guy, you know, and Aaron Taylor Johnson's a phenomenal actor. That's not even the issue. It's yeah. like I'm already attached to the other one. You know, well, it's 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 also like, wow, we really love the scene where they're busting Magneto out of prison, out of the you know his prison cell underneath the, the Pentagon. So we'll do this entire scene in this really great slow motion, and it'll be wonderful. And it really was wonderful. It was so wonderful. We'll do it again yeah. in Dark Phoenix, and it's like really, yeah, come on, guys. And the, and the it's song like, wasn't as good the next time. It was it, well, no, in no, no way was it as no. good. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. You've got to come up with fresh new ideas. Um, it's like my wife, we were watching uh, Dune Part One and thinking, no offense, but we've seen all this before in a shorter movie. Yeah. And now Dune Part Two is coming out. And it's like, I like everybody in it. But there's such a sense of been there, done that. And that's the, the most horrifyingly challenging aspect of making any movie, but especially a genre movie. Um, you know, it's, it, and then when you sit there and think, hate to say it, dude, but the first movie got this element, worked, you know, did this element better. Well, yeah. the second movie does this element better, but they have better actors. And yeah, the special effects are much cooler. But then you see the shots from the filming and you've got like seven characters and in the middle of a giant soundstage where there's real... sort of... 
only the center of the actual set is fully constructed, but it's surrounded by this giant blue screen where the rest of the universe is projected. And again, I find, I think back to 2001, which is one of my benchmark concepts. And it's like Kubrick built all of this stuff. And more importantly, it's like, wow, you're sitting in the, you're sitting in the shuttle heading up for the moon. And there are 17 screens and they're all broadcasting totally different videos. And he filmed every single one. And it's like, wow, yeah. that's so cool. And the most fundamental reality is when you see um, Gary, forgive me for forgetting his last name, jogging around the, 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 the core um, of the spaceship heading of their spaceship, the Challenger, heading out to, to Jupiter. And he actually, it's actually a set and he's not moving it at all. He's jogging in place. The set is rotating around him. And you look at it on screen and it's the most extraordinary thing because, oh my God, how do they do this? But you don't care because you're looking, you know, he makes two complete orbits around the, the rotating set because you have to rotate to generate gravity so he can actually do all this. And from a visual perspective, it, it is like, wow, because it's a physical construction. It's not CGI at all. Yeah. Um, you know, well, you, you look at moments like this where the director, the director of photography, all of the technical people involved in the film are figuring out how to do this and do it right. Here's a story. I know we've got nowhere near comic books, but this is where this oh, is the foundation hey, of all this stuff. I, I've, so, I've, carved, I've carved out time for stories just like this. I'm very excited. So please. So it's 1967. And they're filming 2001 and they, they're almost there, but they've run out of money. You know, they've got 9.8 million and they need another. So they send one of the crew, one of the people to New York to make a pitch to the MGM board. And they're all sitting there and it's like, we've invested so much money in this, you know, like $9 million. Mind you, it's, you know, $1960. So, you know, you can fight a war and go to the moon with that. But while they're talking, one of the executives is like flipping through all these photographs that are on the, the table. And, and in the middle of it, he looks at, excuse me, excuse me. Yeah. I'm sorry. Am I missing something? When did we establish a functional base on the moon? Has NASA been keeping something secret from everybody? Because he was looking at shots of, of the footage where um, the, the NASA director of operations and, and his crew are walking across the moon and they find the monolith. Yeah. And he thought it was, you know, and you're looking at shots of the shuttle descending into the, the, the moon base. And he thought it was real, which is exactly what, you know, Arthur Clarke and um, Kubrick were trying to do. And as soon as the, the, the representative, no, that's all sets. It's Borum Wood. This is what the film looks like. And they're going, holy shit. <laughs> and they, they greenlit it right then. I mean, it's the same as Kubrick did in Dr. Strangelove. You look at the, you look at the, the, B-52 sets, and you think, I don't care if this is fiction. It looks real. It yeah. looks totally real. And that's when you had to do all the work, and you had to think about how we do all the work. Now, again, you just program in, and the CGI is there, and the AI is reformatting the CGI, and you can change it in like 30 seconds. 
the key in in comics is how do you plug these pieces together in ways that just reach out and grab the reader and gather them in so that you're you're flipping through the pages and you're seeing what you what the creators hope is brilliant art but also with the dialogue and captioning that helps the reader bond with the events and more importantly with the characters because if you don't fall in love with the characters by page three or page four what's the point you know the minute the thing that that Raimi did in the first Spider-Man movie that that actually all came together in the last Spider-Man movie where you had the three Spidey team up. Sure. You know, where you have Mary Jane saying, go up there, walk across the ceiling. Really? Yeah. <laughs> and he is and he st and Andrew Garfield sticks himself to the ceiling. No, no, no. You, from one side to the other. Okay. And he does it. And then the mom, uh, the kid, the other kid's mom says, could you, could you get clean up that corner? We can't reach it. <laughs> and you look at, and it's so simple and so yeah. basic. And, and then, um, what's the station? The first movie, Toby Maguire, Toby Maguire steps through and, you know, in a later scene just pops the, the, um, web out of his wrist and the other two, Whoa, <laughs> that is so cool. And even this, a sillier but real scene from later on where the current Peter Parker is like, are you guys Avengers? Oh, what's that, a rock band? Yeah. <laughs> because the Avengers didn't exist in any of these earlier stories. That, the thing about that film that made it wonderful was it was all about character. The differences and yet the similarities between the three Spider-Man men. The fact that the current Peter was dealing with the death of Aunt May as both of the previous, well, Andrew Garfield was dealing with the death of Mary Jane. Oh, sorry, Gwen. Yeah. And Toby Maguire was dealing with the death of Uncle Ben. You know, it it worked but it worked because it's all about character. No, and that made me think of something you were saying before. The problem with doing teams is, you know, the Avengers works, the film I'm talking about, because we were invested in at least most of them in their own movie. And then the problem with, you know, I mean, we, you know, I don't want to go too deep into the dive on the Eternals, but the fundamental problem is there were too many characters. And I know that book has too many characters and I don't know how you rectify it, but uh, there were so many characters and I liked some of those actors very much. Even oh, no, in I love the actors. actors. Yeah. Yeah. But it was also like, I, I don't know, who am I supposed to care the most about? And it was it was very tough in in that way, you know. Well, it also and, it also came up to flawed realities, which is hi, we're the eternals. Hi, I'm the kid eternal. And over the last how many thousand years it never once occurred to you to look in the mirror and say, shouldn't I be getting older? <laughs> which is the flip side because well, eventually in a year or two, whenever they do the sequel, you will be older. Yeah. And this is a problem. I mean, I, uh, you know, whenever you have a character who is a kid, each season things get more complicated if it's a TV series. Right. And I, I don't I don't want to uh, you know, this is obviously not a particularly uh, current reference, but it's the Jerry Mathers effect. Uh, by the end of Leave it to Beaver, you're like. Oh boy, what what happened to the beeve, you know? Well, um the TV series Young Sheldon? Yeah, sure. It this is its last season. Why? Because Sheldon's a teenager now. Yeah. He's like almost caught up to Jim Parsons in season 1 of Big Bang Theory, you know. He's like getting close to that age. So yeah. it's like, yeah, I guess I mean, we have to be done with Young Sheldon. Well, it the thing about the thing about comics is you can freeze everybody forever. The thing that so 
pissed me off um, is I had plans for, I mean, the last half of Kitty's adolescence, I had, you know, I knew what I was going to do and I knew what I was going to put her through and where I was going to take her. But for me, it would take her like two or three decades, if not more, to cover the five years from yeah. her being 14 to being 19. And then suddenly because a, an actor, an actor, the current writer on the book wanted her to have shenanigans with Pete Wisdom. She instantly, and it was pointed out that you can't have a 15 year old have sex with, with a, a, an adult that's actually illegal on both sides of the Atlantic. Correct, yes. So bingo, she's now 21. Except, and this would work if he was at DC, but this is Marvel where it's all integrated together. And in that one moment that no editor called him on, he destroyed Marvel continuity irreparably because once you cross that threshold, and I, when I became a boss, I tried to, re I tried to reverse it. She woke, you know, I, the first issue I wrote with her in it, I said, you know, she, we, I established she was still 15. And the number of letters we got from fans who were like, no. Well, so we, it wasn't worth the effort fighting it. So we just went back to the way it was. But the thing that Stan said right off the bat, this is what he told me. <laughs> Me and other P new hires back in the day, my, my subtle way of saying, yes, I was hired by Stan, <laughs> um, was you get to play with the toys for a specific, you know, for as long as you're there. But when you're done, you put them back on the shelf in the condition you found them. So the next writer can start fresh and will not be codswalloped by a whole bunch of continuity that that is a mess. I mean, the way I dealt with it was, I'm not going to leave. I'll just stick around for as long <laughs> as I can get away with it. And, you know, the next writer can play with it, with what I created, because I'm there. Sadly, I never anticipated departing Marvel the first time uh, in the way I did, but there you go. It's well, just well, it's interesting because the idea would be like, okay, yeah, you can, you know, give uh, Sue Storm a short haircut when you, you know, and then you leave the book, but it'll grow out. But if you've changed someone's age drastically like that, and it's not like, oh, well, you know, th you know this happened over two years, so now she's two years older. But yeah, to do one of those magical snaps, it made me think about what you were saying that Bill Bradley said earlier uh, that, you know, you can pass a bill in Congress, but then someone will undo your bill. So you can mm -hmm. write a great story. You can have, and I've talked to you about this many times, you can have the impactful death of Jean Grey, but then they decide, well, we do need her back for X Factor. And, uh, you know, you're like, okay, well, I guess that's out of my hands, you know? And uh, Well, no, actually that that's very interesting because Anna Senti and Barry Windsor Smith and I were out to dinner to plot X-Men 199 the second part of, uh, of our trilogy that never came to pass. The, the trilogy, the, that issue. Oh, the, the life death, yes. Life death, yeah. Yeah. And as we we're about to sit down, oh, Chris, I have something to tell you. Yes. Um, Jim approved the resurrection of Jean Grey. <laughs> and I sat there for a minute thinking all sorts of inappropriate words. And I said to Anne, excuse me, I have to, I'll be right back. So I got out, went out of the restaurant, ran back to the office. It was a Friday. Everything, everybody had gone home, Jim Shooter especially, because he knew there was, this was going to be a shit storm. And the elevator was locked. The door was locked. I couldn't get in. So we went back and plotted the, the issue. And so I went back home and had some very nice bourbon. <laughs> and figured out how to fix it. So I went in Monday morning and, you know, said this, you cannot do this because you're saying to every fan 
who has who hated us six years ago and has become aware of this is life you know people don't always get through you know they don't know they don't live forever sometimes something happens that is heartbreaking you deal with it you move on if you say we were only fooling you're just telling them that that it was a lie um and we'll never be able to get away with anything like it again i mean because each time we give it a shot the readers will go Pfft. so here's my solution you want to re you want to reformat you bring the ex the original team back into the into the reality no problem so what happens scott has brought comes back to lead the team in other words he's re-upped for another term another tour he was this was unexpected he was living happily ever after in alaska but you know if you get called up for another tour you've got to go madeline goes with him why because when you're the wife this sounds very sexist and very inappropriate but that's what you do in a circumstance like this she and think of the emotional confront the emotional consequences scott's anxious because part of him is like i'm leading the team again but part of it i've got a wife i've got a son what's going to happen to them if something goes wrong but more importantly he's leading the team more as a professor x of of x factor but the the emotional integration consequences good feelings bad feelings between he and madeline who knows i mean i would have fun with that but what about you need a gray okay not a problem her big sister sarah who i've established she has yeah. mutant powers but we don't know what they are yet she is the new cerebro a living cerebro her power is to generate mutant abilities test for you know she looks at someone she knows whether or not they're a mutant either a potential mutant she touches them and you and the power comes to life this way you can find out who whether this is is this going to happen now is it going to happen a generation later is this a good person or mutant a bad person or mutant x factor deals with it but because there's always a but she's brand new at this she doesn't know quite what she's doing she makes mistakes and sometimes the mistakes are small potatoes sometimes they're disasters she might activate someone who is a villain or who ends up being a villain they have to deal with it but more importantly she's unattached so now bobby hank and warren have something to do scott's married he's over here on the sidelines he's running things but he's he's not center stage on the romance that side the other three are well what does that mean well you know bobby has got identity problems am i straight am i gay am i something altogether different well talking to gene's big sister who is the was the brains of the gray family that'll be nice well she maybe she ha talks with hank because she's not sure how you know her parents had enough trouble dealing with Phoenix. How are they going to deal with her too? And Warren, hey, I'm the billionaire. We'll just go out to party. <laughs> and if you want Gene, if you really want Gene, there are an infinite number of alternate dimensions. Yeah. So wait a year, bring her in. But this is Gene at 16. This is Gene who has the hots for Cyclops except that Cyclops is 10 years older than that. And he's married with a kid. And she feels she can't go back to where she came from. Her big sister is still her big sister. But what do you mean I died? What do you mean I'm buried? What the? <laughs> and but then you deal with her trying to get I mean, it's in effect, in effect, the reverse of me bringing in Valeria in i mean valeria was like me doing playing with that concept and salva and me having a great time but 
you find a way to do it that gives readers what they want, but in a way that makes them want to see what happens next. If you just pop Gene out of out of the the, the cocoon know, in the Bay, East River, yeah. No, Jamaica Bay. Oh, you're right. Which Jamaica is not Bay. an infinitely deep body of water. It's like maybe, I mean, you drop the space shuttle in it, it doesn't sink. It just floats there. Right. It's you know, but but then you're then you end up rolling into the entire sinister thing and yada yada yada. That's why it took Wheezy and me three years to get around to dealing with it because a Wheezy and Walter had to establish their their creative relationship with. X Factor. We had to make them real in the X canon. And we had to get to the point where we could deal with what was going to happen sensibly. But the flip side of the coin is if if I knew then that they were, if I knew that Gene was going to be resurrected, I probably wouldn't have created Rachel. Because right. her whole point was to be the stand-in for Gene, you know, coming from an, coming from another dimension where Gene wasn't dead, but yeah. she was. Phoenix. Well, the the interesting thing, because you know, uh, you you and I have touched on some of this before. The the thing you're talking about about uh, Sarah Gray that uh, isn't something that I, I think you'd gotten into before, and the idea of identifying the mutants and possibly being wrong. It's sort of reminiscent of the film Minority Report, which is I don't know, fifteen twenty years ago at this point, and sort of that idea of like we're anticipating things, but yes, you oh, can get them wrong. Tom, you know, with Tom Cruise. With Tom Cruise, yes, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. it's, it's, it's a fascinating idea and uh, you know, not to, not to bash too much, but that early iteration of X factor where they were essentially the ghostbusters, it was like, what, why did you do all this? You know, I think that the, the Louise and Walter Simonson run was a much more readable, enjoyable book, but you know, there was at first it, it just didn't, you know, I don't know. I was like, how old was I? I was like nine when that happened. I was like, Oh, this uh, I don't like this as much, you know. And uh... see, you should have read the first draft of the first issue. <laughs> I wish I could. Where, where Scott comes back to the team, and the the whole issue goes by, and and Madeline is, aside from when he walks out on her and doesn't tell her why, she doesn't exist. Mm. I mean, my my basic point to Jim is you cannot have a hero walk out on his wife and child and not fa deal face and deal with the emotional consequences. And even in Walter, we see in Walter's, it took him a year to get around to it. Yeah. And then, then it's like, I'm trying to contact Madeline, but she's vanished. Why? Well, I mean, that's why she ended up going off with the X-Men to the you know getting killed with them and you know being secretly resurrected because <sighs> you can't there are things there are lines you should not cross or at least i feel you should not cross and having a parent walk out on the other parent is something that far too many people readers and creators have dealt with yeah or have to deal with and it's not a lot of fun and no and I, and, I, and I felt like it was such a disservice to scott summers who prior to that you felt like he was right up there with like captain america or yeah. superman like he was like he could really yeah, he was really like the great all-american guy and then he does this and you're like Oh, that doesn't that doesn't really mesh and sort of what you were saying earlier no, your idea for x factor the idea that he would have moved you know he would have gone back to x factor with his wife i mean you know families move all the time for a new job for one parent or the other yeah. so it would it, it would have worked and there definitely would have been an interesting dynamic if the the young gene from an alternate reality pops in while this well, woman that, who looks just like her in 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 your design not a clone of gene gray but that's something that they decided later uh, i believe i believe that's after you left or maybe that was just a book you didn't write i i don't i can't uh, keep track of all of it <laughs> but it's it's that's the problem. It, it's on the one hand, 
these are fictional people and you can play and do this and this and this but they the the thing that made marvel so special at least to me as both a reader and a creator is the the relationships and that they were grounded to a significant extent on a reality that was recognizable i mean the that franklin was reed and sue's son was great the fact that she lost her second child is heartbreaking and that that had an impact you know stan and jack you know did a or was that well it was it it was impactful yeah and that's what sorry the cat's sneaking in i, I was wondering <laughs> but that's why when you know when salva and i were doing the ff for me bringing valeria into the book was fun because she's the kid's sister but she's valeria von doom valeria yeah. richards von doom and that's it's like huh <laughs> And and she's as creeped out as everybody else, but she's the grown up, quote unquote, adolescent grown up. So she's looking after Franklin. So for me, that was I, I had a lot of fun with that. I hope Salva did too. I hope the readers did. But I knew I was only going to be there for I mean, I would have loved to have been there for 20 years, but I was going to be there until I wasn't. And it was always structured in a way that if we needed Valeria to go away, she could go away as right. as a, abruptly and permanently as she arrived. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's uh, definitely the nature of you know these, especially the the team books. I mean, even the the FF, the the era when I first started really reading comics like every month, uh, She Hulk was in the Fantastic Four, and you know Ben Grimm was off on the Beyond World, uh, and I was like, oh, I like both of these characters, and then he comes back, and I'm like, okay, this is cool too, but you know, I mean, the 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 roster change in the X-Men, you know, this is, this is not something I have the time for, but I wonder just how many X-Men were team members during the 17 years that uh, you wrote the book. And that's uh, probably a fairly high number, but uh, well, uh, maybe for the next the time one, I talk to you, I'll try and count. The ones were all my creations. Yeah. I mean, the thing, well, it's like looking at the movies again. Now, this is something, a story I've told a lot. But I was looking at, at Logan, which in many ways is, I think, the most, it's certainly the best written of the three Wolverine films. Yes. Simply because it captured both Logan's character and Charlie's character on a level that was far more accurate than before that had been done before but the la the endings it pissed me off because it didn't work to have charlie just killed yeah so i came up with alternatives and i think they're fun but they're just mine they're not on screen and that's the frustrating thing um and the fact that it's only like a 98 minute movie which again compared to a great wow. many other movies is really really short yeah um but you have to find a way to bring the characters to life um it's like in apocalypse I'm watching the movie and I'm thinking, oh boy, interesting storm, presentation yes. storm. Yes, I, I for one was excited that we got Mohawk Storm. I that's the era that uh, that, that I love. So I was like, oh, I'm glad we get to see that on the screen. Sure. And I was ecstatic over over um, Psylocke because they got the costume right. Yeah. Um. But then nobody did anything. 
Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like Apocalypse, they they gave uh, Magneto pretty much my origin. Yeah. But Apocalypse just stood around and did basically nothing. Yeah, it was definitely uh, a, a misuse of uh, Oscar Isaac's talent, who, you know, he's great in the Everyone's Coen Brothers good. movie. Well, yeah, it's, it's not just him. But uh, yeah, it, it was definitely one of those that I was like, oh, I was excited for like images on the screen. But the story certainly uh, left a lot to be desired. But, you know, I like the way Kurt teleported in that movie. There were things that I thought worked that hadn't in earlier. But on the whole, uh, I think that that was a that was a sign like, oh, I don't think they they really don't know what they're doing at this point. Well, again, this for me, I what I found totally what the Dickens is their insistence. We're going to we're going to remain locked into the the um, timeline established with uh, first class. So we're all in the '60s, and it's moving ahead logically from the '60s. So by the time you get to Apocalypse. We're in the early 90s. I'm going, huh. Okay. <laughs> so you're going to tell me that um, uh, that gene, the gene in Apocalypse is the same gene as Famke Janssen yeah. in the original X-Men seven years later I think. exactly Whoa. that's a, that's rough that's and a, that, that's a, that, that's a jump um, from sophie turner to funka johnson in only seven years yes well any even more the, the jump from um original charlie to patrick yeah. stewart james mcavoy james uh, mcavoy uh, to in Charlie's. that movie his, his head was shaved but it's like wow he still has kind of a baby face doesn't he <laughs> it's not even that it's just like He's like 40 and, and Patrick Stewart is not. <laughs> yes, exactly. You know, or Sir Patrick, one should say. Sir Patrick, thank you. So, you know, my, again, thinking of it the way I, I would have done it, because I'm pissant, um, is like, it's, it's quite simple. You get up to this point and... It sounds like Gene a microwave... Saves no, it's the it's the laundry. Oh, I see. <laughs> Hopefully it'll stop beating soon. But you have Gene save the universe. Okay, that's cool. What happens next? Oh sorry, my apologies. You have Logan and Charlie save the universe in in uh Days of Future Past. Correct, yes. Excellent. Okay. So for me, I would have ended the film, you know, uh, Hugh Jackman comes back and says to Patrick, the, the history I remember may be a lot differently from the history you remember, different from the history you remember. And Charlie, and then he turns around, Gene, Logan. Oh, Scott, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. Logan, this is our daughter, Rachel. And that Sophie Turner steps out. And it's like, huh. Then Logan steps off, off panel. We don't see him. You run the credits. You get to the end of the credits. Jean wakes up from the worst nightmare she's ever had. Looks around. And the Phoenix effect is like swirling around the room. Scott being Scott is fast asleep. Of course. So, hmm? Yeah, I'm agreeing. Of course he's asleep. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so Gene's like, what the heck? And the Phoenix just sweeps out the door and down the hall. And Gene goes racing after because she knows where it, it's going. And and she's Phoenix as much as where it's going. And she gets to Rachel's room and the Phoenix is swirling around Rachel. And then it it reaches, the wings reach out and gather them both in. And it rockets into the sky that's it. Yeah. So you get to the next film, which is Apocalypse. Correct. But it's set two years later in the present day. So there's Gene, there's Rachel, 
everybody's, you know. And the th other thing is that Charlie is Patrick Stewart on the outside, but he's James McAvoy on the inside. He could even be James McAvoy with hair on the inside. So the idea is that regardless of what the outside Charlie looks like, inside he is kick-ass himself. Who still kind of has a faunch for uh, Mystique, but we won't go into that. <laughs> so this, so they go up against um, Apocalypse. Apocalypse is looking for a new host. He's not interested in Charlie. Charlie's too old. He's not interested. Actually, you know, he, the his his interest is in Jean. So. But first he has to get Charlie out of the way. So he goes up against Charlie. And there's a big fight between him and James McAvoy inside the mind. And McAvoy loses. And this is the, the first iteration of the whatever it is, disease, mind shock that Logan was dealing with in Logan. Oh, my God. Continuity. What a thought. <laughs> it's, a, it's a crazy idea. Well, but so he gets Gene and he's about, you know, we could argue whether or not he shaves her head, but, and he's about to transmit into her. And this is where Rachel steps in and teenage Rachel steps out and blasts him that we get the ending of, of apocalypse, but in manifesting the, the Phoenix comes out full bore cooks him like a goose, and then Rachel is so supercharged that she just, she can't stick around. She has to go up into space. So Ra Rachel and the Phoenix zoom up, and everyone's going, wow, but we won. Credits. As we're getting to the end of the credits, you suddenly hear a mayday. You know, and then the camera opens up on a Shi'ar starship. Like, looks like it's been in a fight. Yada yada, blah blah blah. We get to the transmission. It's the Shi'ar homeworld where Lalandra, head of the, essentially minister of defense, is woken up. What the hell's going on? And gets a communication from her from her captain and the phoenix just eats you know we find out what happened to dabari the supernova and the last scene is the ship being destroyed well we get the ship is destroyed the last image that that Lalandra sees is the dark phoenix and it's like end of film the next film is Phoenix, which is Gene and Rachel save the Omniverse from Lalandra's brother, the insane emperor. And this is what they do. But what about Dark Phoenix? Well, that's the next film. Right. And that ends up as the, the Westchester incident. Who dies? I don't know. Well, that's a whole different discussion. But the point <laughs> is, you do each film, and this is where my idea was, you approach each X film as if it was part of the event, in much the same way that they did the Avengers. Each film ups the ante. Each film gives you characters that you fall in love with. Each film puts them at significant risk, but more importantly, it puts everyone else at significant risk. And along the way, you have Rachel, maybe she, you know, Kitty's her best friend. They're hanging out in, in you know, junior high or middle school. They're having a real life, but there's something outside. And you establish a bond between the characters and the audience. You make it a reality and a, a, a conflict and consequences that the audience can recognize and embrace with 
and are sitting and are left sitting on the edge of their seat terrified because they're in love with these characters they want a happy ending they want to move on positively but and the buts are always what matters and you know I'm, it's the frustrating thing is so many of the films just they have no no sense of emotional consequence and it shouldn't be that no and i think that uh obviously you know uh, sort of referencing the main x-men films there's also you know you have to take into consideration the there's that that first wolverine movie the the origins movie where you know it, it's Liev schreiber's fantastic as Sabretooth. the the movie is less than fantastic you know and it's uh no i thought i thought deadpool's reaction to his oh i know this i know this little toy <laughs> yeah and but just considering the reaction of that movie the fact that they ever made the the deadpool movies we got with ryan reynolds was just surprising because i feel like just you know it was not a well received film that origins and your point is you know actually have the idea map out all the movies and what they should be ahead of time and you know you always have to you always have to have the emergency ejection button in case okay well this movie tanked so now we have to figure out what we're going to do well, that, if they go well you should be able to be like yeah here's our plan for three four or five movies well the thing is if you, you can have sequels, you can have consequences, but each movie has to stand alone on its stand on its own. Each movie has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And you know, you, you that's why the teaser is always at the end of you know, in the middle of the end of the trailers. Do you want to see it? Do you not want to see it? Um, you you have an escape clause. In a in a way, but the thing again, as I keep saying, it's always it's it's a it's a seduction, it's a it's a romance. Um, who is who is um, Gambit? What makes him interesting? Why should we care? Um, my first idea for a Gambit movie is it has nothing to do with, you know, when I was pitching it to Lauren uh, and Fox, it has nothing to do with the X-Men. Why? Because if you put the, the minute you put the X-Men into it, Gambit becomes part of a giant continuity. Whereas this would be all about creating a bond between Gambit and the X-Men, a Gambit in the audience. Then you introduce the X-Men. And as he's discovering who they are and what they are and why he should care or, or not, the audience is going along with him. You know, it's by the time you get with the Avengers to, uh, what's his face, the robot? Ultron. Ultron, Avengers 2. If you actually look at it, there's a, I mean, Ultron for all his actions is substantially, his monologues are character monologues. He's establishing relationships with, with Pietro and Wanda. He, you know, their, their real, Wanda's realization of who um, Ultron really is his her reaction to it, he feels betrayed. She feels betrayed. But at the same time, you've got the witch establishing, no, sorry, Wanda establishing a relationship with with Banner. Yeah. But then there's the existing relationship with Hawkeye. And what's that all about? So, but that that in turn sets up that final moment in uh endgame and game, yes where she and hawkeye 
are arguing with each other over who gets to sacrifice themselves. Right. And the reason she is so in absolutely focused on it being her is because she will not take Hawkeye away from his family. These are, in a way, it's her family as much as his. And that's why she's the one who has to die. And he knows it. But he's done so much awful stuff in the five years that for him, he want, he desperately wants the release. Yeah. And for her not to give it to him is refusing to give it to him is A, you take responsibility for the shit you've done as well as the heroic. Yes, you helped save the universe. But, you know, you can't, you have to earn back the love and respect of your kids. Yeah. And I mean, you don't get the easy way out. It's exactly. uh, you know, the one, the one level, you know, spending five years killing, you know, Yakuza crime bosses. Okay. there, But, you know, deal with it. Don't, don't take the easy way exactly. out. Exactly. Yeah, so, I mean, the thing I find interesting about the Marvel TV series since then, because the, the movies haven't quite gotten there yet, is how quickly the five years has faded away. It's there. It gets referenced every now and then. But, you know, in comics, it would be much easier to, to, make, to sustain that. Because you can do like a one-page, two-page visual flashback, you know, where everybody... I mean, we've never seen Ant-Man, since he woke up, deal with it. Yeah. You know, deal with his daughter being older, dealing with his ex and the cop. Have they even come back? Whatever happened to them? It's, you know, you get references from other people. I was away for five years. You know, actually, I think Natasha's sister was vanished for five years. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. Because they, which is fine, but don't just leave it. You know, I, um, it's like for me as an audience, they've spent, so much time setting up freedom force uh no, no i don't think it's freedom force it's uh it's the idiot captain america yeah yes exactly the john walker i think that's thunderbolts and uh, it's the idiot captain america uh john walker and then uh i, I forget who else is natasha's yeah, sister did. yeah uh yelena yeah yelena. and and uh, Julie Dreyfus's character, Valentina, is going to kind of run that as like the Nick Fury. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of focus. And it's it's interesting well, because, you know, we're talking about uh, Yelena. Obviously, Florence Pugh is a great actress. I think uh, arguably she stole that Black Widow movie away from uh, Scarlett Johansson. But it's like you, the, the characters are there. The actors are there. But it's like they just somehow miss the story sometimes. You know, well, it's just it, there is no story at the moment. They're right. all sitting around building the base of it. And all we know for sure is that the John Walker is a. <laughs> you can John call him a dipshit a... on this show. It's okay. <laughs> well, I'm, I, I have a relationship still with Marvel. So. Oh, okay. Well, I, I'm the one who said it. He's... And look, I mean, I think that the character of John Walker is actually an interesting character just don't expect us to like him. Well, know? it's not I even think... to like him. Too many years are passing. Yes, I agree. And I have to say, speaking purely as a fan, Julia Dreyfus is not who I would choose to be to be Valeria Alexa de Fontaine. Yeah. Who is like the deep the deep heartthrob of Nick Fury's life. Right. Especially when she's drawn by, um, ugh. who did Sorry. Nick Fury? Uh, created Nick Fury. Oh, that's is that Steranko? Yes, 
Yeah, I'm don't sorry. I was trying to think of someone more modern. That's why no, I no. wasn't sure. But yeah, yeah, that you is Storanko. You don't consider yeah. you don't consider Storanko modern? Well, I mean, you, you know, the creations uh, are uh, before my yeah, time. From the but 60s, still but what the heck? Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it's like the other thing is outside of Deadpool, there's no humor in any of it anymore. But yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, I, I'll, I'll, I'll push back a little bit that uh, Ant Man is still mostly humor, but maybe at the expense of story. Whereas Deadpool, I think it all works because his crazy over the top persona just fuels the the story as well. Ant Man, it's a lot. It's more like, you know, the old the old idea, the joke writers, the kids in the hall, just feeding jokes to you know talk show writers. It's it's a lot. It's a lot more gags, I guess. Yeah, but Ant Man, uh, he's only had two out. Of, he hasn't had his third yet. No, this, the third was Quantum Mania, the one where they go into the quantum realm. And, you know, I thought of it when you were talking about it. it's just like, oh, yeah, his daughter's older. And there's a very brief narration where it's like, yeah, 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 we're we're figuring it out. Whereas like that would be, of course, great character stuff to just s sit down and talk to Cassie, his daughter, and be like, so uh, what did I miss? Instead Actually, of jokes it's about not bad. Like, here's it, a birthday the cake. problem with but see, the problem with Quantum Mania is all it is is a setup for um kang which which is a different problem they have now uh yeah. because they, yeah, they, you know, they either you recast kang or you find a new bad guy which you know uh, i well, i feel like you I mean, can they've, you they've can certainly come, recast recasting him with something. yeah i mean the the guy who has you know multiple variations you know thousands and millions throughout all these different timelines you just get another actor it's fine you know it's not that hard there's characters where it would be hard but uh, Kang can I, be, see, he I, could be Kang. I never liked Kang. That's my problem. But is again, it, it's is just it the fact that it's just, you know, one of the issues with a guy like Kang, it's like, oh, he kind of, it's like too much. You know what I mean? It's almost like, you know, what I think works about a character like Superman is like, yeah, but he can't get near those green rocks. Okay, there's something. Kang, it's like, oh yeah, how are you going to actually beat him? You know, and uh, I, I mean, I'm sure they find a way, but oh, they have to find. No, I mean, but that's not the the problem. Is it's going to take three year, three films to do it? Correct. Which means the better part of ten years. Correct. <laughs> and and the anxiety is that the payoff won't be worth the investment. I think that's and, a safe and bet, yes. there's no one. In the current, I mean, the fact they're bringing back Chris Hemsworth. Yeah, for a, uh, I guess they would make a fifth Thor movie with uh, Chris Hemsworth. Yes. Well, and but also he seems to be twitching around the Avengers again. You're right. But which I have no problem with. But you've got to establish all these characters as passionately and solidly as the original Avengers. Yeah. You know, it's, I mean, this is, when they were, the original idea I think was they're gonna bring in the kid from Iron Man th two. Uh, there's a kid in Iron Man three, and then also in Wakanda Forever, they had Riri Williams Ironheart. So that's like another, you know, Iron character. But there's no, a no, kid no. In, yeah. But see, the kid, that's the reason he's at the funeral, right? In, in Endgame, correct? Yeah. The, Whereas Iron Man three, my idea, the minute, the minute in the first Avengers of those of that two parter, where you have Tony playing with his daughter, and his her daughter, the daughter comes out all six years, five years of her, wearing yeah. wearing mom's Iron Man helmet. Yeah. And I, I looked at that and I thought, bingo. So you, you, you find a young, a kid who can act, who can be plausible, and you make, um, you make her the new Iron Man. Well, well, they had shot a sequence that the movie was already too long. The moment when Tony does the snap before he dies, it's, it's an adult version of his daughter and they had cast, you know, a, a somewhat established actress. She had done a show for Netflix called uh, 13 reasons why not. And yeah. they filmed this whole thing and they had it and then they cut it because 
running time dramatically, it works better. So I think that you're you're certainly onto something that, uh, and, and her name's not but Cassie, see, I forget what her but, name is, but the daughter, yeah. Tony's daughter is certainly something that's in the mix for them, I'm sure. But, but see, that to me is like, no, you're 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 Mr. you're screwing the pooch, <laughs> because the way to do this is because this is the kind of story, basic story I told that the Sal and I told in in the um, in my the Chris Claremont big box. Yes, but the the thing is, if you have a an eight year old daughter, a, a middle school daughter, who is wearing the armor and in the armor she not only looks like iron man she's got robert downey's voice <laughs> and you've got and robert downey is the cgi in the armor who's looking after her why because it turns out it's really tony he screwed up the he screwed up the programming or it it just went one step too far and instead of just being a cgi of tony it's it's the real him and he he can't let heather find out because she'll kill him right <laughs> but he can't abandon his daughter he's going to look after her and they're going to work together to make the armor better yada 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 but the whole and because it's just cgi especially these days you can just have fun with writing cool script i mean yeah he probably won't want to do it but on the other hand if you throw enough zeros who knows? Yeah, there's there's, but the, there's a the point whole, where it could work for sure. But the, my whole point was, so she's Iron Man. If if there's a moment where she has to dump the costume, again, because it's all just CGI, the costume vanishes, and whoever's chasing after Iron Man, all they find is a middle a kid in sixth, seventh grade. Who pays attention to a girl in seventh grade? So, and you sign her to fi a five fil film deal so you can spread her around. And as she gets older, you can you can just run with the passage of time. So by the time you get to the 10th film in the contract, yes, she is 21, but you've watched her grow up. And I think that would be, for me as an audience, it would be a lot more fun than just casting someone as a 20 year old and watching her evolve it to 30, which is just, okay, so what? Right. It, the, the, I, but the idea is to find, find ways where the character on screen can, the char the audience can identify with the character on screen, can want, can embrace them, can follow along can want to see what happens next with them. It It's like, you can't, you can't make a fourth Fantastic Four with Doom. Yeah. You know, I mean, I look at, okay, you've got, um, what's his face? A totally unexpected Reed Richards. Pedro Pascal, who Pedro people, Pascal. of course, know from The Mandalorian and the, yeah. the HBO show Last of Us, yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm interested in that. Sure. But then you look at Sue and Johnny and especially Ben. Okay, Ben's going to be nothing but CGI anyway. Correct. That's nice. But, you know, and at least hopefully this Sue is a natural blonde. I'm like, you know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Jessica Alba, Kate Mara, neither were natural blondes. True, yes. Oh, Jessica, but now what? Yeah, you know, it's it's you've got to find. By the way, I don't say this to be controversial. I still feel like the in terms of on the screen, yes, obviously very low budget. I feel like the the best FF story that we got was the one that Roger Corman did for only like a million dollars. There's obviously some issues with it, but you're like, back yeah, they kind. No, no, it was in like uh, the early '90s, oh, okay. and it, it it never actually came out. There's a documentary about it, but mm -hmm. uh, you can, you know, I I may have uh, spent twenty dollars to buy a VHS of it at a comic convention in New York in like 1993, and twenty more dollars to get the Star Wars Christmas special. But I digress. And uh, it's like, oh yeah, the the those movies, you know, where Chris Evans played Johnny Storm, and 
uh, Michael Chiklis has been. It's like some of the casting was right, but again, the, I don't know, especially the Silver Surfer one, I don't know. They just they didn't quite work. And I can't even, I the, sometimes you can put your finger on a movie why it doesn't work. Those I'm like, they were fun to watch on the screen, but I've never rewatched either of them. Well, I think they're talking about having Galactus for real this time. Oh, wow. Okay. Which, okay, that's fine. Instead of just being a giant cloud. Yeah. Um, But... I don't know. I mean, the the I think part of the problem is that the the reality of the world, the technology of the world, the superhero world as much as the real world has has evolved so far, so long, much since those movies and the FF itself. Yeah. Um, the thing with the X Men in and of itself, the X Canon is something it's something that everyone can relate to being the outsider being the minority being the people that everyone else is creeped out by and therefore afraid of and that is something that it was mentioned in the original X3, but it's never been an essential part of the canon. And I think for me, without that, none of it works. I mean, that was that was the essence of the letter I sent to Fox way back in the day that actually convinced them to give it a shot. You know, they had the rights. Uh, they... They were gonna. They were gonna black. You know, they were just gonna put it on hold, because they no one could. They could not figure out a way to make it work. In terms there was a there were there had been false starts. So there was one I believe with James Cameron. You know, there was like stuff in like the late eighties and oh. into the nineties. <laughs> oh, oh, I feel like I feel like I pulled on a thread that's gonna be a whole podcast episode. <laughs> oh no, I mean I was there. Yeah, no, I know. The whole, the whole point was that Stan and I theoretically, were there to pitch it to, to Cameron. Um, and uh, he had, um, oh my God, Catherine Bigelow was going to be the director. Okay, sure. Yeah. I mean, and I was sitting here thinking, yeah, I got a movie with eight alpha female lead characters. She's a remarkable act, a director. Let's go for it. Yeah. And the problem was that that meeting had nothing to do, from my perspective, to have everything to do with the X Men. Perhaps from the perspective of Cameron's team, it had everything to do with the X Men. I mean, Cameron was going to executive produce it, you know. Right. Uh, but and my ambition was, I. I'd sit there behind the director and take notes for the entire film shoot. And then I would pitch the second film. Right. Um, that was my, that was my dream and move to the West coast. Of course, you know, life would have been totally different then. But you could have rooted for the Dodgers. <sighs> we'll, we'll skip over that. <laughs> But then, you know, Stan looked at him and said, I hear you like Spider-Man. Yeah. And Cameron loves Spider-Man. And within 15 minutes, the conversation had turned to um, the X-Men died and Cameron was going to write, produce, and direct X-Men. Uh, sorry, Spider-Man. Spider -Man. Yeah, there's a there's a script out there for that James Cameron Spider-Man. It's, uh, well, it's, 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 it's a radically different uh, Peter Parker than I think uh, people would have expected. But Who cares? Yeah. I mean, it's Cameron. But the sure. I'm sure Arnold Schwarzenegger would have loved it. Like <laughs> but, I mean, uh, the whole, yeah. but the whole thing, the problem was that no one realized that Marvel had sold a dozen options on Spider-Man every iteration of Spider-Man and none of the studios had really realized they were all options for the same person. And 
they were all going to cut a deal. They were all ready to cut a deal because, you know, they figured Cameron, it'll be a 10 figure film. Yeah, of course. And, you know, a small percentage of 10 figures is still a lot of money. But Carol Co., who had the latest version of it, of the option, they couldn't afford to let it let it slip. They wanted it all. And they were so obsessed with it that Cameron just walked out of the meeting and said, you know, I'll never do this, touch this fucking thing again, or words to that effect. Well, it's interesting because, you know, dealing with the options, uh, it was reminding me of something that I saw literally just last week. And boy, have we veered off the course, but I'm going to talk about this anyway, that uh, Warren Beatty still has the option on Dick Tracy. And uh, he doesn't want anybody else to do anything with it. So every few years, he does these very cheesy, very corny uh, Dick Tracy short films that all count legally as sequels. He's wearing the suit. I think he mm -hmm. was interviewed by Leonard Malton in one. This is like just last week. And sometimes that's all you have to do. You know, yeah. I think before Daredevil reverted to Marvel, before they did the, the Netflix series, Fox still had the option. And they thought about like rushing something like that out. And then ultimately they were like, you know, it didn't really work. The one we did with Ben Affleck, let's just let it go. But there's a lot of stories. And then Disney really bought them all. Yeah, right. Exactly. They just had to wait. <laughs> so, yeah, when you deal with the the movie rights and and who has it, you know, I mean, you, you'll talk to authors of books and it's like, oh, yeah, that'd be great. I would love that to be a movie. But, uh, you know, the person who has the option doesn't want to do anything with it. Well, but the, the challenge is that that when you're structuring out the next 10 years for a film. For a studio, well, we got to have three Eternals. Yeah. Well, the first one didn't do great, but does that mean we're going to have three um, uh, um, oh God, Mo Morbius? Well, I don't, I don't think Morbius is going to get more. I think that that was a one. Well, what about uh, Spider-Woman? Well, uh, Madam Web is uh, oh, sorry. literally, uh, well, I don't want to be too, but it is not just one of the worst comic book movies I've ever seen. It's one of the worst movies I've ever seen. And I was talking a lot on the show about it with uh, my friend that I went to go see it with. And it's like movies that people widely dislike from comic books, like Morbius, like Electra with Jennifer Garner. Those movies are not good, but those movies are better than this because there's a, there's a star on the screen. There's an actor Jared Leto is a very interesting actor. I'll watch him in a bad movie. Uh, I, Jennifer Garner is charismatic, and you you you're drawn oh, to her. Don't forget Daco that, Dakota oh. Johnson's like a like a bag of wet laundry. You know, it's uh, and I'm saying this. You don't have to comment on that. It's it's a I'm very saying. bad film. <laughs> but that but I mean the challenge is that Disney's filling up space because it has to. Yeah. But this goes back to what was going on with with X3 is that and I wrote the novelization. Um it's and you had a cameo in that movie. I believe you were mowing the lawn. <sighs> it the thing they were pleading with Fox because you know uh, they lost two directors in six, you know, they had no one. To yeah. Direct. Yeah. Brian, they, Brian Singer left to go and do a Superman, Superman. movie and it, uh, effectively kind of put the kibosh on two franchises for a long time because he did a Superman movie people didn't like. And uh, then that X-Men movie was not as well received. So well, because uh, yeah. the, well, then he, he turned, uh, he gave it to Brett Ratner. Had, no, no, no. Ratner was oh. the third one. Oh, the okay. I didn't even realize the second that one okay. was, the director of uh, First Class. Oh, I know that director's name. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it was very good. It's yeah. just he he just had collapsed like six weeks, uh, no, like four weeks before they they were scheduled to start shooting. Oh, so wow. here we are in in May, no June of five. The movie's scheduled for for May of six. And they were pleading with Fox to just push it to seven. Yeah. Because they only had a first draft screenplay. And you never shoot a first class, first draft screenplay. No. 
and okay, Fox. Other, otherwise, you built the Quantum sets. of Solace, the the Bond movie that they made during the writer strike in like 2008. This the second oh. Daniel Craig. Yeah, so that, that's that's what happens when you shoot. And uh, by the way, Matthew Vaughn is the director we're talking about. I right. just couldn't remember his name. But the so no, I mean basically, Fox said we built the sets. You can you can do anything you want with the dialogue, but we're not. <laughs> you know, so they they shot it, and I mean, you're doing a Dark Phoenix film. And and uh, Famke Janssen doesn't do anything until the last five minutes, yeah. and it's like, and also Fox wanted all the mutants killed off, except for the X cast, right? And even a couple of them could go, and so you're watching the movie, and it's just you can see bits and pieces of what it might have been. But basically, it was boring as hell. Correct. That, that is exactly what that movie was to someone who paid money to sit there and watch it. I, I was yeah. definitely bored. Uh, it, you're talking, you know, Jean looked bored. And, you know, Dark Phoenix should not look bored in the movie that's about her, you know. Well, but it wasn't about her. That's the problem. Yeah. It was, it was about the, everybody but her. It was the, they had like the cure. And of course, Magneto was in there. And yeah, it's a, a lot of these movies you're talking about. You know, even a Spider-Man movie that did get made, the third one that Sam Raimi did, you know, you have Sandman, which is great. But then it's like, oh, and we're going to need Venom. And it's like, well, why? Because, because guess, cause Venom sells T-shirts. But, uh, you know. Well, and, but also because uh, Sony had rights to all these characters. Right. But only one film that could that could be used to present them. Yeah, you know that's why that's why they were doing. I mean, ideally they would have put three, four, five, six, seven villains in it. Yeah. But the problem is, every time you put somebody in a film, you have to establish them. Every time you establish them, you have to make them real. And that takes five minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes, and suddenly you have three villains and and one hero in a situation, and you're already an hour and a half or an hour 45 into the movie. And, you know, unless you're doing a two and a half hour blockbuster, you're out of time. Right. Yeah, exactly. Or if it's uh, Matt Reeves, Batman movie, uh, you have three hours. And uh, the only film that I've seen in a long time that uh, has a fourth act, I felt like the movie was going to end. The, you know, that's the most recent Batman movie with the. Oh, the Batman. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I was, I was switching universes for a moment, but uh, that's always the example of like, oh, that movie could have ended three other times before it actually ended. But you that's, know? But, you know, I see. And the question I always find myself asking is like, I'm sorry. I understand the Batcave, not a problem. I understand Wayne Manor, not a problem. Who built all this shit? <laughs> I mean, in watching in watching the Justice League, when this giant hovercraft pops out of the water. Yeah. I mean, and you see Bruce Wayne twiddling with the engine earlier. I mean, Ben Affleck just going... It's like who built all who paid for all this stuff? Who delivered it? Yeah. I mean, you yeah. know, come on. He could he could draw up the blueprints, but he's not going to be down there and you know, and uh, Alfred hand me a socket wrench, you know. But so. see, at least Chris Nolan gave you a plausible moment where he's sitting there talking to um well uh, those movies had Morgan Freeman as Lucius. Morgan Fox, Freeman, so thank yeah, you. Yes. But and Morgan Freeman is just giving him all this stuff yeah. that you know, why didn't we use this suit? Well, because it cost two and a half million bucks per suit, and yeah. no one in Washington wanted to pay. Oh, okay. Can I borrow it? You own it, Mr. Wayne. Oh, hey, nice car. <laughs> Same thing. Yeah. It's I mean, obviously Morgan Freeman knew everything. I mean, all you know, Batman smiles. They're they're in this together. He's like the other half of Alfred. Very cool. And away we go. It, you know, it's like Nolan was telling us just enough for for us to plausibly deny all this left between things. But aside from that, you could go with it and think. 
this is really cool. <laughs> but in so many shows there or so many movies, you don't have that. Yeah. But because Nolan had the clout and the screenplay to allow him to take time, to take yeah. a breath, to just, you know, move at a relatively sensible pace and then build gently to an ending that had you on the edge of your seat, which, you know, I have no problem with that. Yeah, no, the, the best movies do that. And, uh, uh, you know, speaking of uh, hour and a half run times, uh, in a moment, I do want to steer it back towards uh, comics. But because okay. we've been talking about movies, uh, I do feel like people would like to hear your thoughts uh, about you know, you're talking earlier about end credit scenes. So there was uh, one that got a lot of excitement in the Marvels. And the big reveal there is that in this alternate reality, uh, Monica Rambeau, who I grew up being a Captain Marvel, uh, some people know her as Sentry. So her mother is uh, binary in this alternate universe, which may or may not be the X films universe. I'm going to assume probably not quite just a little tweak. And, uh, for our visual audience, we're showing a still from the movie. So we do see her, uh, as binary. And just by way of comparison, there's the, uh, the great unveiling of the binary suit, uh, that Dave Cockrum did, uh, on uncanny X-Men 164, you know, a fairly, you know, at least a decent attempt at the representation. She's yeah, got the, yeah, she's got I'm, the bangles uh, that uh, Ms. Marvel wears in this iteration here. Yeah, but, I was wondering uh, about that. Yeah. So, yeah, she's no, got I those. Thought, I thought she, but they, they, I, I, when I first, when I saw that, I thought, oh, is there this way of, is this their way of saying, yeah, we swiped everything from her for Captain Marvel. I mean, sorry, right. for, um, yeah, Captain Marvel. For Captain Marvel, yeah, for Carol Danvers, yeah, yeah. Which I thought was really uncool, but yeah. what do I know? <laughs> no, I, the, I thought it was a nice teaser. Yeah. I, I thought it was really cool. I can't imagine that they actually had Kelsey Grammer. Well, mm -hmm. I guess they, they could just put little, lots of dots all over him and do it as a CGI. Yeah, if they, if they wanted him physically as the beast, but he did the voice. That's fine for me. Yeah, and to hear that voice, that uh, you know, I think that uh, that that you know, especially when you consider a movie when it's cast, what that came out in two thousand two, there's no one that comes to mind that would be a better beast than Kelsey Grammer. So it's great to hear that voice. You know, they didn't use Nicholas Holt who did the younger version of Hank because we wouldn't recognize it. You know, but you hear Fraser Crane talk, you know, it's Fraser Crane. Actually, the thing that cracked me up was I thought Ellen Page was a brilliant Kitty Pride. I agree. Yeah, not going to work now. No, no, that uh, would be a completely different character, and you'd have to tell a story. Might be more interesting, with, but who knows? With Kitty, yeah, um, and uh, you know what? Uh, I I just uh, sort of a a personal nod. Uh, the the Marvels uh, is definitely a Marvel movie that uh, there were mixed opinions on. I had fun with it and I was able to mostly have fun because it was the first of all these MCU movies that I took my kids to. Uh, I felt like that runtime of an hour 45 and uh, my daughter who's six, uh, love, uh, you know, she loved the kitties as uh, the way she characterized it, all the, the flurkins. And uh, I'm just sharing this with you because it's, uh, it's a cute moment that I like to brag about. So on her birthday, uh, Amon Vellani, who plays uh, Kamala Khan, Ms. Marvel, she was doing an in-store at a comic book shop in North Hollywood because she co-wrote a Ms. Marvel series. And so my daughter Lucy shows up with her goose flurkin and uh, you know everyone there at the table found her to be very adorable. And uh, uh, Iman asked, what was your favorite part of the movie? And my daughter did say the kitties, and she said me too. And I think the reason I'm sharing that is because one, I'm bragging that my my daughter's adorable and she has that uh, cute Ms. Marvel shirt, but also because I think it's easy to get away from sometimes with these properties that, you know, 
people like me have been reading since honestly I was just about her age mm -hmm. is uh, oh yeah it needs to be fun for the kids like I mentioned that three hour Matt Reeves Batman movie I can't imagine watching that with my kids at any time in the next you know five ten years or maybe ever you know I could probably sit down with the Tim Burton one with my son he's eight but it's it, you know and look you want programming movies that are suitable for kids but also enjoyable for parents I completely get that but and I see the Marvels and I'm like, well, I don't know what people wanted. I, I thought that Iman Vellani was great as Kamala Khan on the TV series. And they kind of had her mesh well. Not everybody loves Brie Larson. I, I think she's a fine Carol. And I don't know. I didn't need something huge from that movie. I was just like, all right, you, you, can, you can see some reshoots, some things that don't quite make sense. But when you're watching it with your kids and a big bucket of popcorn, it's like, yeah, we had fun. You know? Oh, no. I, I think the questions I have are like, Okay, I like the planet of the singing, the singing planet. Correct. Yes. But was this is this just to like give everybody really new dumb costumes? Uh, that might have been it. Yes. <laughs> it, it's. I, I did like that Monica uh, had the wings that she wore as Captain Marvel, like in the eighties. And she's like, what are these? I don't need these. So, you know, there's little nods for basically nerds like me. Oh, really? Yeah. I, must, I must have missed that entirely. Well, I, I rewatched it with my sister the other night. Uh, so I, I, it's fresh in my mind. <laughs> mm. no, I watched it on TV a couple of weeks ago. I didn't. Yeah. It showed up on Disney plus uh, <sighs> yeah, earlier this month. Yeah. The, I mean, the, the fight scene was interesting with everybody bouncing back and forth and up and down yeah. and around in circles. It just... I found... The Captain Marvel stuff just... I don't know. It's it. Again, there are references to the five years when everybody's out of sync. Yeah. But that's it. You know, it, it's it. It's like with the Nick Fury series. The miniseries. Oh, Secret Invasion. Oh, yeah, that that uh, that that was uh, I mean, it, the, the fact that it didn't turn out the way they wanted is is clearly evident that. Nick Fury's in this movie, The Marvels. There's Skrulls in this movie, and there's there's no reference to the fact that a whole series had just happened with the Skrulls. What? I'm talking about the the Nick Fury. Uh, the no, the what whole series? series? Well, yeah, the Secret Invasion series. It's it's almost as if it didn't happen. Oh. Uh, judging from Nick Fury's presence in this movie, in oh, the Marvels, oh, sorry. and the fact oh, that no, they're this, dealing with Skrulls. I thought this movie yeah. was set before that. I don't I don't think so, but you know what? Okay. You could be right. It's it's always like, boy, they make it they make it hard to keep track, don't they? Well, no, that but see, that's to me, that's that's the, the biggest flaw in the, the Marvel universe right now. And I, I also didn't like the fact that hey, let's kill off all the character the, the back characters from the original Marvel universe. Yeah. You know, it's like everybody who ran the helicarrier, yada yada yada, uh, when they killed off his his second in command. Uh, Agent Coulson in the Agent Avengers. Coulson. Yeah, yeah. I was really pissed. But yeah. then it's like, okay, you're telling me Nick Fury is now married to a scroll. Oh, for God's sakes. Okay, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. But it just... I... I, felt, I mean, I, I gave it three, three, uh, three episodes and I just didn't care. It was just you, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what? You didn't. You didn't miss anything doing this show. We every week we were uh, okay. Let's talk about the new episode, and we just wanted it to end. Uh, well, you know, that's that's so. You know, I mean, Jesus. I mean. <laughs> <sighs> <laughs> yeah, I think that I think that says it all. That uh, there's a lot of those moments. But, uh, go ahead. No. Well, what I was going to say uh, was uh, just uh, something you talked about earlier and sort of tying it together with, you know, what my kids like. You were talking about 
uh, Kitty. And since the last time I talked to you, I, I hadn't seen this in a while. Uh, so, and I think this was in like, I don't know, 1988. So I was like 12. And uh, Dave Cockrum was uh, at a uh, convention in Middletown, New York. Mm -hmm. and he was doing sketches. And I believe the sketch was $20, believe it or not. And uh, he said, well, who'd you like me to draw? And I'm like, well, my favorite, it, it was, she was Shadow Cat at this point. So right. my favorite is Shadow Cat. And uh, not only did he do this great drawing that uh, you can see on our screen right now, mm -hmm. he threw in Lockheed for free. Mm -hmm. I didn't, you know, I didn't have to pay an, you know, extra ten for Lockheed. And uh, you were, you were writing on threads about Lockheed uh, the other day, which is mm -hmm. another place people can find you at Chris Clare Mountain. And uh, I just, uh, you know, Kitty was that character that, you know, I'm probably about seven when I start reading the X Men. And yes, she's thirteen and a half, but I'm like, okay, that's somebody I can relate to. Yeah, you know, and that I think great idea. storytelling has the character you can relate to. You know, you look at the the pilot of ER. It's Noah Wiley's first day on the job. The pilot of Homicide: Life on the Street. It's uh, Agent Bayless's first day on the job. So make it accessible. And obviously, you know better than anybody. Any issue of X Men is somebody's first. So make it so that. You know, we don't want to over explain everything. We don't want people to feel like, you know, we're being redundant, but we want to make it so that you kind of know what's going on. And I think, yeah. Uh, yeah. And we'll throw in, a, we'll throw in a mid, a small, cute dragon who can eat planets if he's really pissed off. <laughs> if he's hungry. I mean, this, yeah. is, this is, uh, <laughs> but that, you know, I, uh, it's, there's sometimes I, I read, stories and my my gut reaction is do these people have no concept of character yeah and I mean, well it's you know and i'm yes i i know i'm being totally possessive and totally arrogant i don't know but you know it's it's i mean i'm doing a a Logan story now where the thing, the essence of the story as I'm working through it is, and I mention it every couple of points. Yeah. Is oh somebody's somebody's telling you you've been talking uh, enough and uh, I'll do I'll do, yep. do my best to wind things down fairly soon. Oh wait, sorry about that. Yeah. That's all right. Well, yes, and uh, obviously everyone's able to see uh, some of your current work with uh, Logan on Magic Poor Nights, uh, which, uh, as we established at the beginning of the conversation, is now in stores with uh, issue two being a few weeks away. But uh, you were talking about sort of, you know, telling stories with Logan. Well, I mean, the interesting thing about all the about Magic Poor Nights is that the way it's working is uh, the first issue is the setup with the issue that's out. And then uh, two, three, and four each has a specific focus um, on one of the three characters. And then five is the, it all comes together for a resolution. So um, what happened well, I mean, the second issue, the cover for the second issue kind of tells you, A, who's the focus of the issue and where, where we're going with that one. Um, I I know you have it in your background. Too. Yeah, no, I'm getting I'm getting it. Yes, yeah, so there's a I've got all these variant covers for issue one. That's so I, I need to sort through it. But here is issue they two. should ever send me a, a, at least one copy of each variant. So I, oh, my God, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, it would be. But my local yeah. store, I don't think we'll have any of them, so by, especially now. It's been too long. Yeah, this is, yeah, issue two gives you a sense of who the villains are. But actually, I was looking for the the primary cover, cover which has Natasha on it. Oh, okay. See, I thought that was the primary cover. That's, uh, 
here i i know what to do all right so we're talking about the primary cover of which is the one you Magic have behind Nights number no. two. Yeah. Oh yeah so it's the oh i see it's that one it's the one behind me so no, it, yes, no T, it's not when, actually when i show this uh this is the actual listing for oh, okay. number two so i think that is the main cover that's uh philip tan is yeah. the uh, artist for that one yeah but then there's another cover that is focused on natasha um i see yeah and uh, i've got a couple of those uh there's a couple of good ones with uh natasha i think that uh this is probably the one you're talking about uh once i get back over to the there glasses. yeah well that's all right i i you know i've had my glasses on the whole time for moments just like this is this the one we're yep. talking about okay uh, yes i'm so glad i found it <laughs> which gives you a sense of of her role in this. Yeah. And we go into a little bit of her history as to how, you know, the interesting thing about them is that Cap, of course, fell off the board in 1945. Yeah. And, but Logan and Natasha sort of stuck around, even though she was working for the KGB. Yeah. You know, Logan didn't care. No. Um, so he, they would always have fun together until of course, roughly about the time she became an Avenger, he got into Barry Smith's origin story. Uh, which is where he got implanted with adamantium. Right. So that's why they split up and lost touch. And by the time <clears throat> Logan recovered, Cap was an Avenger, Natasha was an Avenger, and we moved on from there. <clears throat> so we're, the, the, the arc touches, it involves their history, but it also involves the consequences and everything that happens in Madripoor Nights derives directly from 268. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to steal <laughs> from anybody. I'll steal from myself. Well, yeah, exactly. It's, uh, you know, it, you're just, you're just borrowing from, you know, the best writer, you know, you know, that's fine. It's, <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> but uh, yeah. And uh, that's Especially sort of what we were doing a signing with Frank. <laughs> oh yeah if you're doing a side frank but the uh yeah and that's sort of what we were talking about in the beginning that uh this is continuation of that story in uh, mm -hmm. uncanny 268 and um but, go but ahead sorry i'm sorry forgive me for interrupting i just no no please go ahead i don't want to go too far over budget b before beth walks up and says what I know. I told her I was going to do my best to keep it to ninety yeah, minutes. Yeah, that always uh, But it, it never, it never really quite gets it gets there. I know we we hadn't even talked about the comics much at ninety minutes. Well, but no, anyway, but the, the, the thing with the next story is a point that I I come back to a number of times in the story, which I also do in in Madripoor Nice is Logan is not a nice person. Correct. Logan is not really a hero. He acts as a hero because he is part of the X-Men and he has made personal bonds with a number of the team. You know, Scott has earned his respect. Aurora has earned far more respect. Um, and then there's pride, which is a whole different level of reality. Um, and to a lesser extent, Jubilee, but that's a whole different thing. But this yeah, goes they, they back just, they actually, just have a shorter track uh, record at this point. Yeah. You know, they've only but, known each other for a little while. Yeah. But the other thing that was that is was referenced during the original run in terms of Jubilee is what he does to her is a supervillain thing. He knows this is a twelve-year-old kid. How she got to be like thirty is in no time at all is you you mean you mean how she got to give birth to a vampire but we don't need to get into that <laughs> sorry but he essentially 
a situation evolves where she becomes his partner because he desperately needs someone to to basically look after him while he heals. But he does, and he knows that she will never recover from this experience. It this defines the future of her life. Yeah. What he's doing is a supervillain thing. In much the same way that his being involved with Kitty has defined her life to a far more significant extent, if not for him. Well, she to fall into Ogun under Ogun's. Yeah, I you know. never thought about either of them that way, but it's honestly, it's only like a step removed from, you know, basically like what the hand raising Electra, you know, I mean, it's, it's like, yeah, you're a nicer guy than the hand, but you're still putting these children, you know, children in these situations. He's not a nicer guy than the hand. He's as, he's as awful as the hand. He's just better at it. That's fair. That's a great point. He's definitely smarter. Yeah. And the More interesting terrifying. thing that forgetting the, the continuity from, I guess, 30 plus years ago, I forgot that this was the point where his healing factor wasn't working. So we mm -hmm. have the thing where every time he pops his claws, he starts bleeding. And I know just to circle back very quickly for the movies, you said that that was the moment when you saw that first movie when, you know, uh, Rogue asks Logan, does it hurt? And he says every single time. And it's easy to forget that, you know, well, this guy's got a healing factor, so it doesn't matter. But now when it doesn't work, it's like, look at all the amount of blood that he gets on his suit just in issue one of uh, Madripoor Nights because his claws are out, but also he's just gushing blood the whole time. It's uh, It was just a reminder that I-, I And this remember. is, and we had to be, we still had to be tactful about that. Yeah. No, I mean, that's, that's, it's a primal side of his reality that, Sadly, in my era, my original era, because of the comics code, now just because of, I guess, corporate policy and the need to be tactful, we can't go into that depth. But it's just that he does more harm to the people he loves the most simply by being next door than he would otherwise uh and the i think the challenge for him is he has so few people that he cares about or people that care about him it hurts he knows it hurts um and yet for him that's life yeah, I mean, even in Madripoor Nights, he's talking about how he's there with Natasha, Betsy, and Jubilee, and he's like, you know, I don't, I don't have a lot of friends. Like these are, these are basically amongst the only ones that I have. So when I am with them, uh, I, you know, he tries to, you know, make the most of it and, you know, not have to fight off a team of ninjas. But I guess well, the best. Thing and when plans. you think about it, the two grown-ups in that in that trio. I mean, the thing about my, pre yeah. <laughs> okay i'll be down in a minute sorry the thing that is established in the first issue is that in terms of electra and in, in sorry in terms of natasha and in terms of betsy you don't want to get on the wrong side of either of them correct yeah i mean the point the one thing I've tried to establish in Betsy's life is she may look like a supermodel. And, but of all the X characters, deep down inside, she is, should be the most terrifying in many respects. Right. Because if push comes to shove, she's a stone killer. And I guess that the uh, the issue where I point this out as as bluntly as possible is the one Alan Davis and I did an annual where they all get swiped by this alien 
yeah. who wants him to penetrate this fortress and get him the the giant. Yeah, I think that that's uh, yes, annual no. number eleven. Yeah, no, and it, she's a very uh, complicated character, you know, from you know the history before she ends up in the X Men, and uh, we should we should dive into Betsy sometime. Uh, before I let you go, because I know you have to go downstairs, I do want to talk about one more thing, which mm -hmm. is the fact that these Marvel DC collaborations are finally being reissued, and it gave me an excuse. And I don't think I had opened this. I've had it for a long time. I don't think I had opened X Men Teen Titans in probably about thirty years. And and uh, it was, uh, it, it, you know, at that time I was, I was very, I was very much a Marvel guy. I didn't read anything DC. I've read a little bit since then, and uh, you know, I found the characters of the Titans, you know, to at least have a better understanding of them. But it's, it's a great story, and uh, I'm glad that uh, it's getting reprinted again. Obviously, you, you can find this version of it, but there's going to be an omnibus of these Marvel DC collaborations. I hope um, so. I just wanted to take a quick moment and talk about how it comes to pass that they do it, but also that you and, and Walt Simonson, who I always think his art is tremendous, but being inked by Terry Austin in this book, it's like, it adds like a level that I don't usually see. Walt does a great job with his own work. I'm not trying to despair, but it's just more a, a credit to Terry Austin who oh, just makes Terry everything is, look better. Yeah. Terry is one, has always been one of the best there is. I mean, this is the kind of thing. I mean, Weezy, the first, the first was Spidey and uh, Superman. Spidey, yeah. Superman. Then it was yeah. us, and then there was going to be the the next one. Anyway, the, we bounced back and forth. DC, Marvel, DC, Marvel, and then the fifth one was going to be Teen Titans and X Men by Marv and George. Right. So Marv Wolfman and George Perez would have done a follow-up to this oh, yeah. story that you were. Yeah. yeah. Well, not it, a follow-up to this story. They would have done their own. Another adventure. Yeah. 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 Um, but that by that point, Marvel and DC were pissed off at each other. Yeah. They I believe the sticking point is the uh Avengers Justice League crossover that I believe George actually drew pages for, but uh I I, I don't believe ever saw the light of day. So uh yeah. yeah but um, the thing the thing with this was um, the core image was Dark Side, Dark Phoenix. Correct. I mean, how could you go wrong with that? And then Len, being the editor of Teen Titans, pointed out that we didn't have a Teen Titans villain. We had a, a Marvel villain, an X-Men villain, but not a Teen Titans villain. So that's why... Um, um, Dark Side? No, 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 not Dark Side. The, oh, um, space yeah. That, they call him the Terminator in this, but uh, people yeah. know him as uh, Deathlock as well. Right. I see. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, that's where he got in. Yeah. But, it, you know, the, we were just, I was sitting there just saying, this is what we're going to do. Dark side, dark Phoenix. And and Wheezy, either Luck or Wheezy had somehow set it up. Walter was just w walking by the, the door to her office. And as I said this, he stuck his head and said, somebody mentioned dark side. <laughs> And that was it. We were off and running. Yeah. Um, but it again, it it's just one of those one of those magical stories where all the pieces fell completely into place. I mean, our attitude was, okay, this is okay. We're, we're, no problem. They all live on the same world. They know, all know of each other's existence. They just haven't met because that's Yeah, and I thought that was interesting because I feel like you tell a story like this now, a, a wormhole has to open, somebody falls into it. And I like it, that it's just like, oh, yeah, the Titans Tower is just in a corner in New York that the X-Men don't usually No, 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 no. See, you look at New York Harbor. Right. So here's Manhattan and New York City. And next door, a little, you know, next door is Gotham. Next door is Metropolis. Next door is Jersey, New Jersey. <laughs> right. You know, it's the harbor is much bigger than we you, than we're used to seeing. Uh, clearly, the Verrazano is a very impressive bridge. <laughs> Correct. But you can you don't need to explain any of this stuff. I mean, you just again do five five pages to establish here's Robin, here's. Uh, Flash, here's yada, 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 yada. And then the Phoenix image pops into um, uh, Starfire. Starfire's head. The first one to see it, yeah. And she wakes up and is like, ah, 
Yeah. Why? Because she's not from our neighborhood and she knows exactly what the Phoenix represents. Yeah, it was it was very uh refreshing to read the uh the Dick Grayson Robin in this because uh when I have read DC, he's been Nightwing for so long, you know. So it's like, oh yeah, yeah, he's like this, you know, he's again, he's like a Captain America or Superman kind of character, you know. It's, really uh, cool, really cool shorts. <laughs> look, not uh, not all of us can pull off those shorts, but uh if Dick Grayson can, that's why he does. Uh I'm, I'm anyway, not sure pull off those shorts is the phrase you want to use. You know what? It probably isn't now that now but, that no, I but, say it out loud. <laughs> but the other the but the, the flip side of this is you know, you have the Phoenix image terrorizing the, the Titans. But then you have Darkseid reaching into the heads of the X-Men to draw out pieces of Jean's memory so he can create her until he gets to Kitty, who's never met her. Right. And knows nothing really about her other than what she's been told. All Kitty does is wake up and look at, see him face to face and scream, which, again, the trick is to find logical reasons why all this fits together which is why we start with dark side and uh, what's his face on the flying, you know, wheelchair. Oh yeah. Uh, I wasn't honestly familiar with that character. Is his name Megatron? No, but that's the point. You, yeah. you, the idea is we introduce these characters always Metron. on the presumption Metron's that no one's ever read the stuff before. Yeah. And where are we? We're at the edge of creation where you have Jack Kirby's, you know, wall. Yeah. What's on the other side of the wall? Even gods don't know. No one's ever made it through the wall. You can't get over the wall or under the wall. It's, you know, I mean, this is Jack. Jack is extraordinary. But the beauty of it was Jack was teamed with Stan. And right. what Stan brought to this was an ability to say, we'll do this stuff, this issue. And maybe we'll do that stuff next. I mean, the thing with Jack is you're reading, you're reading the new gods and it's like the first issue, five new concepts. Whoa, this is great. Then you pick up the next issue. Whoa, five more new concepts. <laughs> yeah. And you pick up the next issue. Oh God, five more new concepts. And they're all really great, but there's just, it just keeps going on and on and on. Yeah. And even, and all it took was like 10 issues for DC's head to explode. Yeah, it's because, uh, you know, the, the game Jenga, where you put all the blocks on top of each other, eventually they're going to fall over. So you might need to start dividing up the blocks into smaller piles. Yeah, Right. But that's what they did. And they've been living off of that for the next, you know, ever since, which is great. But, you know, the advantage Marvel had was it Stan did all the necessary work right off the bat. And yes, it would piss off Jack. Absolutely. But look at how Marvel has lived on that ever since all the yeah. characters he created, all the realities that's, I mean, that's what makes for me writing X-Men so much fun because I'm, I'm trying to run in their footsteps and keep up or maybe even find a way to skip over them a little bit, but all the while, the key aspect of it is find a way to get the reader's attention, find the way to tell a story that just has them reading through the book, falling in love with the characters, getting to the end, and then going berserk because they've got to wait 30 days to find out what happens next. And if you do it right, the more you do it, the more excited the readers are, the more eager they are to see what's happening, going to happen next. And the more they want to tell their friends so they can have someone to talk to about it as they go. And the thing I always try to do when I'm writing this stuff is find out what element of character bonds them all together. I mean, I'm doing this. I'm probably going to get yelled at for this, but what the hell? I just pitched an eight-page story for the Iron Fist 50th anniversary. I mean, Iron Fist isn't one of my characters. I came in late, yeah. you know, after Tony Isabella and Larry Hama and 
and Roy and and God knows who else have had done their couple of stories, but he was fun. And I loved Misty and Colleen. And once we threw in Luke Cage, who isn't, isn't part of the story, it got crazy. You know, I went to Archie and said, what do I do with this? And Archie said, if you can't, if you can't figure out what to do with Misty Knight, Colleen Wing, Danny Rand, and Luke Cage, just coming down in the morning to have a cup of coffee, <laughs> you don't deserve to be a writer. Yeah. And he's right. That's the point. You you don't need anything other than the, these four characters coming down to get morning coffee. So what I end up doing is I've got this eight-page story. And the, the essence of the story is Danny fighting Wolverine. Except Danny's blindfolded. And he doesn't know. He has to find Wolverine. Wolverine's not blindfolded and his claws are out. Yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, the fight's being watched by Misty and Colleen, who are talking about it. And then Misty gets yanked up into, you know, out of nowhere, or telepathically yanked out of, the, out of her body by Jean who's looking for, who's basically been running around looking for uh, Sabretooth. And just for the fun of it, and they'll probably say, I can't do this. Uh, Jean, because Misty's her roommate. Hey, you want to see what it's like to be me? And boom, has got Misty in, you know, Black Phoenix. Wow. <laughs> If I'm going to be self-indulgent, so that's yeah. what first drafts are for. I, I mean, you're talking about an eight-page story, and I'm yeah. like, oh, I feel and like this is a like, five-issue miniseries. No, I, I could do it for a year. But and this is <laughs> like, what the fuck? I mean, if you thought, well, but see, there, that's binary. Yeah. Uh, but then the final, the final cutaway is um, Sabretooth, you know, is in Madripoor having finishing a big fight and is see I I punch all you punks at which point Mr. Sinister nails him from behind and that's how Sinister gets his hands on on Sabretooth oh. which is my way of saying all the Sabretooths you've ever seen in the X canon my X canon certainly but everybody else's aren't the real Sabretooth. So the, the Sabretooth, the Sabretooth, Sabretooth obviously was introduced in Iron Fist. So that's that's the real Sabretooth. What we've seen since is actually not. Oh, all right. Well, if, if then, you can tell that story in eight pages, uh, I, I'm going to be ready to I'm, read all eight of them. Yeah, but that's the point. You know, it's, it's this is... Um, but then there's what happens next. <laughs> <laughs> well i think that's uh, I know that perfect, you know. that's the perfect place to leave it you always know what happens next and uh so we were talking about uh x-men teen titans will be in this uh, marvel dc omnibus that's coming out they're doing a couple of them and uh of course we started off talking about madripoor knights which and wait, issue you one see issue two it's really cool well I, uh, I, I, I don't know if, uh, if Beth will let me find time in your calendar again, but when it's over, I'd love to talk to you again about Madripoor nights when it's, uh, it's all finished and, uh, loving spending it. time in Madripoor. Well, I, but you know, I think if I hate it, uh, I'll be, well, I'll think of a nice way to say, uh, that I hated it, but, uh, <laughs> well, did you see captain? Um, did you see spider woman? That was so much better. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the, the uh, Madam Web movie. No, I can't imagine a, a world on uh, where I'm going to read or see anything uh, that compares to Madam Web in a long time. But in any case, Chris Claremont, thank you so much for your time. Uh, Chris Claremont on Instagram and Threads. Threads is like the fun version of Twitter for people that maybe don't have Threads. Oh, it is. It's well, yeah, it's it's an offshoot of Instagram, but. Uh, you know, Twitter's a bit of a, uh, the word that always gets thrown around is cesspool. Uh, Twitter's a, a bit of a dicey place these days. And uh, Threads is a little bit Wait, more what's fun. Wait, what's the dicey place? 
uh, Twitter, which people call X now. Uh, you know, there's a change in oh, ownership right, right, over right. there, and I, uh, the people thing, are less I can't happy imagine that. that Disney let him get away with it. Oh, X. Yeah, that's a great point. Well, yeah, that's uh, that, that is a great point. Yeah, no, it is X.com. But uh, I don't know. Maybe the maybe the the mouse feels like there's bigger legal legal battles to fight than X.com. Okay, whatever. I, I, but the the place if you really want to find me is uh, Instagram. Yes, Chris Claremont on Facebook, but mostly Instagram. I've only got like six million and change uh, followers to catch up with Sophie. <laughs> so then, so you'll be over there. And uh, yes, uh, anybody who takes a look at uh, your Instagram will see, as we said a couple hours ago when we started, some of the uh, places you go. And uh, this is your Instagram right here, showing off uh, a great image from Madripoor Nights. Uh, in any case... Oh, yeah. There. See? that? That's, that's the one you wanted. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously. All right. Well, now we have it. And so everybody gets to see that on our visual audience, our audio listeners. You'll have to go to the Geekscape YouTube channel to find it. Uh, as always, Chris, it's uh, a delight to talk to you. Uh, we did two hours and 20 minutes. I could easily do another two hours and 20 more minutes, but uh, I My don't know. My wife would kill us both. Yes, exactly. She would definitely kill us both. So we'll leave it there and until next time. And uh, here on uh, Geekscape uh, next week, we'll be back with Geekscape Book Club. Uh, talking about the echo, the the initial introduction of Maya Lopez in Daredevil. So uh, join us at the same time, same channel for that. But until then, as the great Stan Lee would say, Excelsior.